Can you see my welcome screen, everybody? Nice. Okay. So again, my name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. That's my email address, ben at internachi.org. If there's anything you need, feel free to reach out to me. Email me is great. Um, if you want to reach out to somebody on staff, we're all on the contact page, and that's at natchiorg slash contact. Let's inspect this house. This is a house I inspected a little while ago in California. It has a pool. And we have a lot of information for folks in California. If you wanted to be a home inspector in California, or if you um, need additional resources um, because you're a home inspector in California, I can't find them. Or if you're interested in becoming a home inspector in California, go to our page there, nachi.org slash California. And you can write these links down or you can email me again and I can send you the slide deck. So let's go to our California page. It's titled How to Become a Certified Home Inspector in California. At the top, again, this is at nachi.org slash California. At the top, there's a link to our uh, convention coming up. It's a big convention in Southern California. It's a town called Ontario, not Canada, Ontario, California. And um, you can take a look at the details here. I really like the workshops. There are three three tracks, there's a ton of workshops, ton of information, lots of really good training, and uh, hope to see you all there in all your faces. Look how many uh, fantastic certified master instructors and presenters. It's gonna be a great convention in California. Southern California in October is beautiful. So that's at natchiorg slash California and click the link to our convention. And we have everything you need to be a successful home inspector in California. We even have a link to the California legislation. Um, there really isn't any licensing or regulations or a licensing board. They don't regulate home inspectors, they don't license them or certify them, but they do have some um, code. Um, they do define what a home inspector is and what a home inspection is. We have that language and that code for you. So you can take a look. It's a just a short legal document. We also have a California Home Inspection Agreement. Um, that's the agreement that you and your client sign so that you set the expectations of your client so that they understand what you're going to do during the California Home Inspection. We have chapters in California. You can rub elbows with other inspectors in California. We have a link to our inspectors in California. So you can check out your friendly competitors, essentially. So there we are. There's a big list of California home inspectors. So no matter where you are, you can find um, a friendly competitor. Let's get back to the California page. And we have training partner schools, if you like hands on training, we have partner schools, we have insurance, if you want to protect yourself. We have uh, a little statement from the California Association of Realtors, which confirms there's no preference to any inspection association. You can click there to read their letter. We have a California pool inspection checklist. If you wanted to um, inspect pools in California, we have a checklist for you and that's customizable. Um, and we have free online CE courses for California licensed real estate agents. And you can use that to help you network with real estate agents that you work with. And if you wanna do radon in California, they, um, they have a little regulation about uh, being certified and performing that service in California. And you have to take a NRPP approved radon course. Our course is approved. We have some information about WDO inspection and courses, and it just goes on. If you wanted to be a commercial inspector in, in California, so go to natchiorg slash California for information. Okay, good. Everyone hears me, got a couple questions. I don't think California is on the CE list for realtors. Um, we do, um, so uh, just to make sure, there's an education team and Kayla is the education team manager. You can always reach out to her. She's on the contact page. 
and her email is education at internet.org. I know we have a new course coming out um, as well. So make sure that um, you keep in contact with the education team and make sure that that CE is available for your licensed real estate agents in California. And if it isn't, uh, it must be just temporary because we're always working on it. Good question. What other questions do you have? Well, here's some topics that we can talk about actually. So I'm gonna go over a home inspection. What I did, I inspected this home and then we can talk about anything you want. We can talk about how to perform a home inspection. We can talk about software, business strategies, scheduling, time management, hiring inspectors to grow your business, branding, calculating profitable fees, handling complaints, standards and ethics, real estate agents and job leads, anything you want to do, um, want to talk about, we can do that as well. And there's my email and there's the education team's email and there's a mentoring program that we have in California. We have mentors, certified master inspectors who volunteer their time to help other inspectors be their best. We also have a community forum. You can go on there and talk to other inspectors. So you're never alone. There's a description of InterNACHI. We're a, um, the world's leading trade organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. Inside the organization, we have an actual college. It's a nationally accredited tuition-free home inspector college. This is an internet webinar. You can attend free online live training classes about inspecting houses, writing reports, business and marketing. We also have the Home Inspector podcast. So go to any platform like Spotify and search for Home Inspector podcast and internet Home Inspector podcast will pop up. Okay, let's inspect this house. It also had a pool. A lot of California homes have pools. If you wanted to become a certified pool inspector, go to this URL, nachi.org slash certification. Let's go there now, okay? So everybody can get on the same page. And InterNACHI provides more than 60 additional types of inspector certifications, not just home inspector certifications, but pool inspector certifications, for example. So you would search for, go on this page and search for pool. And here's the pool and spa inspector training and certification program. And this is provided by the only home inspector college on planet earth. And uh, there's a three steps. You join InterNACHI, you take the course, the training course that certifies you. And then we have a continuing education policy. So you continue your education after you become certified. This is my schedule. This is my typical schedule. I used to do two inspections. I don't do home inspections anymore uh, unless there's a camera following me and we're producing a, a training video. Um, but when I was a home inspector, I was a home inspector for about a dozen years, performed thousands of inspections. And it was located in um, Southern, Eastern, Southeastern PA, uh, around Philadelphia suburbs. And we had um, a couple hundred competitors in our market area. So it was very challenging. And we were doing two inspections a day per inspector and um, making about a thousand dollars a day per inspector. And this is my schedule. And I leave early and I come home early. So about seven o'clock, I leave my house because there's driving, uh, you gotta get coffee. And um, come back home about 4.30 before traffic. And then I didn't do any work at night. I didn't write any reports at night. What I did was I wrote reports while I inspected. Everything was done around five o'clock, but it's an early day as well. So this is how you make a great living, or this is how I made a great living. And I wanted to share this schedule with you so that you can think about your schedule. Maybe you're doing one inspection a day. That's great. That's great. And that's one way you can compete with me because I'm going to my next job, right? I've got two scheduled today. And maybe you can market with me, compete with me. Maybe your brand says we slow things down, especially for first time home buyers. And you answer everyone's questions and concerns. You attend to people a lot more than I can do. That's one way to maybe compete with me, right? And that's the fun thing about being in business. You do business strategies and marketing strategies and see how you compete with others. So if you and I were competing, this is my schedule and maybe your schedule is similar or a bit different. But anyways, I had a, two inspections 
one at eight and one at 12. Eight o'clock, three hour inspection, hour break, and then get to the next job at noon. Eat lunch in between, done at three o'clock, wrap things up, right? So let's see. Uh, oh, and if I, um, the, one of the most important things about being in business is your time, time management. So there's an equation. There's a, there's a, um, remember in high school math, there's a factor, the numerator divided by the denominator at on the top of the numerator in the fraction is the amount of money that you make gross revenue divided by time. That is what you need to be thinking about when you're performing an inspection. You have to, you have to, when running a business, you have to pay attention to your time and your revenue. The key is to have a lot of revenue at the top divided by a small amount of time. If it's flipped, if you're not calculating a profitable fee, if you're not generating enough revenue at the top of the fraction, and you're spending way too much time during each inspection, you're not going to make any, any money. The key to a successful business is generating revenue. You want a fat numerators, a big money at the top divided by an efficient time management process at the bottom. And our goal in general, the general rule of thumb was we wanted to make about $100 an hour. At the end of the day, bring home a thousand bucks, gross revenue, gross revenue. So every job was about $400. I charged $400 for roughly $400 for every home inspection. And I was disappointed if I only did a home inspection, right? I wanted to do a termite and a radon test along with that home inspection. So ancillary services, as you can see here, um, I'm talking around 11 o'clock AM, we're talking about collecting the money at the end of the inspection. So it's a $400 inspection, but the profit comes when you would bundle additional services. And that's why InterNACHI -E has more than 60 additional types of inspector certifications so that you can become a home inspector and also bundle other services like a pool inspection, right? So 400 for a home inspection and another 100 for a, the pool inspection, that's a $500 home inspection. Now you're increasing revenue, dividing by your time. And if it if the additional services do not increase a lot of your time, then you're doing well. So you have to pay attention. A lot of uh, sewer scope inspections are being done now. And you could add 15, 20, 30 minutes to your inspection. So you got to be careful. Make sure you're still uh, hitting that billable hour mark that you set for yourself. You want to be efficient with your time. So this inspection took me about two and a half hours. Pretty fast. It all starts with the standards of practice. The standards of practice is the absolute minimum standard for performing an inspection. This is the list of things that I have to inspect and the list of things that I, I'm not necessarily required to inspect. I could inspect them, but I'm not required to. It's very important. So if you're new, this is where you begin. This is the foundation of your inspection process. And from the foundation, from the standards of practice, you build checklists and inspection processes. And then you move through the house using this standard and you write a report so that the standards of practice kind of reflects your, your final product, which is your inspection report. And in between is you following the standards of practice and maybe exceeding the standards of practice in, in certain situations. And there's a flow and you follow the standards of practice and you build that inspection process and you build your inspection checklists and, and you build your report and you keep going. Remember the standards of practice is the absolute minimum. And a lot of inspectors just simply build upon that. They build upon what they want or desire to inspect, or maybe they inspect things, they exceed the standards of practice because their clients demand it. And that's fine, that's just fine. You're, you're allowed to do that. Right? You're allowed to exceed the standards of practice, but you have to start somewhere. And this is a great place to start. For veteran inspectors, this is a great place to remind yourself certain things. 
what you're required to do, what you're not required to do. So in the standards of practice, there's a, there's a section called roof and you're required to inspect the roof. And when I'm inspecting a house, I get there early. So I leave at seven, remember my, my time schedule, my agenda. I leave at seven, get there early, hopefully, and I knock on the door. Maybe someone's there, maybe not. I introduce myself, fully identify myself, got my lanyard, got my ID, got my company t-shirt, got my business cards, got a pull up in my truck. I don't pull in the driveway, I pull maybe, you know, on the street or something like that. And I try to get on the roof. I try to inspect the roof. You're not required, okay, the standards of practice does not require any home inspector to walk upon the roof. So you're not required, even if the roof is flat and only 10 feet above the ground, you're not required to, not required to um, use a ladder, but you are required to inspect the roof. And if you can't see it, you should disclaim it in your report and maybe get somebody to inspect it for you, hire somebody or come back later or figure out how to inspect a roof. So this is the California home. I'm inspecting the roof from the ground level. You can inspect it from the eaves, inspect it from a ladder. You can inspect it from the roof surface. You can inspect it with a drone. You can inspect it with a non-conductive pole with a camera at the end of the pole. And the shingles are thick, really good, high quality shingles. If you don't know how to inspect a roof, or if you wanted some advanced training, on inspecting a roof, maybe go through some code, go deep into maybe um, the installation manufacturer's installation recommendations or the fastening for a particular type of shingle or roof covering material, or in maybe in relation to slope, what kind of underlay. If you want to get deep into, if you're an, an experienced inspector, you want to know more, you can, you can go into InterNACHI's curriculum and learn more. Um, the more you know, the more you can go, you know, the further you know, the further you can go. So I've, I find that certified master inspectors learn a lot and they know a lot, right? And new inexperienced inspectors are still learning. This is a great place to go. Free online training programs. So if you wanted to know how to inspect a roof, you go to natchi.org. I'll show you how to search for it and go to the search. You type in roof. And then there's courses after course about some of them are all video. Some of them are text. And so you read some of them have um, student companion books. So you can download and, and mark if you wanted to. Here's advanced residential roof inspection course, inspecting slate roofs, metal roofs, tile roofs, how to perform a roof inspection, inspecting asphalt shingle roof course. That's a video course. So you just go in there and you learn how to inspect a roof. So I'm inspecting this house. Inspecting the roof early, waiting for my client to show up. I'm not required to walk upon any roof surface, but I am permitted to exceed. So I, I do go up on the roof. There's the roof surface there. And that's part of my brand, actually. When I'm walking upon the roof carefully, um, don't recommend it. It's hazardous. You want The number one thing a home inspector wants to do is come back home safely. So. Um, Stepping on a ladder is dangerous. You can slip off and break your leg. Falling off a roof is absolutely dangerous. Could be fatal. So we don't recommend that you go up on any roof. That's why the standards of practice says you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. But if you do, well, you have to think about why. Why are you doing that? Some inspectors do it because that's what their clients expect. Or maybe they're trying to be the best inspector. Or maybe they're competing with somebody who in their market who goes up on the roof. So if you and I were in the same market and we were competing, you would have to figure out how to beat me in the market because I'm going to promote in my marketing that we go up on the roof. We're trained. I was a home builder before I was a home inspector, trained. My business partner was a, a roofing contractor. So we went up on the roof. We carried tall ladders. We got up on any roof that we could get up on. And we took pictures and we put those pictures in our marketing. Now, how are you going to compete with me? Well, oh, drone is a fantastic way to co compete with somebody who goes up on a roof with a ladder. You get probably the same results, right? You can't touch the roof with a drone, but man, you can get up close. You can zoom in with 4K now, 4K pictures and video. 
It's a really great way to compete in the marketplace. So what is your brand? Well, my brand was something, your, the, your brand is the answer to the question, why should I hire you instead of the other inspector? And so we answered that brand by getting up on the roof as part of our brand. And we felt also that we could inspect a roof a little bit better if we exceeded the standards of practice. So according to the home inspection standards of practice, the inspector shall inspect from the ground level or leaves, the roof covering materials, right? And a couple of the sentences that I use in my inspection report, I would say things like the visual inspection of the roof covering material was restricted by this. Maybe I couldn't see everything, or maybe there was leaves and debris, or maybe it was some other type of, uh, maybe there's a patch and the plastic was covering, or there was snow, maybe there's some snow, or maybe it was a, a slippery, wet uh, uh, roof surface from a recent rainfall. And I, I was unable to see all of the roof covering completely. Just, just to reinforce that a home inspector can't see everything. You wanna set that expectation to your clients as well. A lot of clients and real estate agents expect you to find every problem in a home. You're not required to. It's impossible to find every problem in a home. And a lot of people expect you to inspect everything. And that's not what a home inspection is. A home inspection isn't exhaustive like that. It's not technically exhaustive and it isn't um, complete in that way. We don't inspect everything. We perform inspections according to a standard. And that, which lists those things that we're supposed to inspect and not inspect. Another sentence that I like to put in my inspection report and tell my clients is that any roof can leak at any time. And I recommend asking the seller about the age of the roof because I can't age the roof really. And ask the seller about past roof leaks as well. That should be on the seller's disclosure if it did leak in the past or if there was a roof problem in the past. And my uh, go-to statement in my inspection report is, I did not observe any indications of a and defect. The defect could be an active roof leak. So I did not observe indications of a roof leak at the time of the inspection. You wanna write your reports in the past tense. I did not observe any, any indications of that. That's a good sentence there. But you write your reports also in the past tense, like, um, I checked the roof. I turned on the heating system. I flushed all of the toilets and ran water at all of the sinks so that that happened in the past. You never want to convey something as if it's presently true. So if I inspected the roof at this California house and it was in good condition, I'm not going to write in the report that the roof is presently in good condition because that condition can change. Remember, any roof can leak. Any roof can leak at any time. And they tend to leak just after I perform a home inspection, right? So you wanna set the client's expectation, especially about the roof covering material because it's a big system and roof leaks really can uh, ruin someone's day. So you're not guaranteeing any roof system, any roof can leak, you're not warranting any system, you're not giving that kind of coverage, you're just observing those conditions at the time of the inspection, which happened in the past. And you're documenting that in your report. What did you observe back then? According to Home Inspection Standards of Practice, a report shall identify in written format defects within specific systems and components that were both observed and deemed material by the inspector. So if there was a, a defect in the roof and I didn't see it, it's not going to appear in the report. If there is a problem with the roof and I saw it, but I didn't think it was a big deal, a major problem, a material defect, it's not going to be in the report either, likely. A material defect is specifically defined in the standards of practice. Those material defects are really serious ones, like something that can hurt someone. That's a material defect. Material doesn't mean that it's made out of cotton or, or concrete. It's serious, very serious. And those material defects that I observe during an inspection, I need to put those in the report. That's what we agree to in the standards of practice.
and a material defect is defined in the home inspection standards of practice. Are there other types of defects? If I'm on the roof, I'm inspecting the roof, I don't see any material defects. Should I report on other types of defects, like maybe um, a missing shingle, right? A missing shingle isn't necessarily gonna cause a roof leak, likely, but not necessarily. It's not gonna hurt anybody. It's not gonna devalue the home either, but it should be repaired by a contractor. This isn't something minor. We're not expecting a homeowner to go up on a roof and do a roof repair. We need a contractor. So that's a major defect. You can figure out what um, other types of defects there are and how you want to describe them. So you, go, you can go to InterNACHI's glossary and in the search, type in defect and click search. And there's four different types of defects defined. There's the material defect that's actually defined in the standards of practice. There's a major defect, there's a minor defect, and there's a cosmetic defect. I actually use these definitions in my inspection report. It helps me show the degree, the severity. Is this a big problem? Is this a, a little problem? Is this something we need to attend to right now? Is this something you need to do later? Hire a, a contractor or a professional or electrician or plumber to fix? Is this something like a a dirty air filter, minor, that you can do yourself. Is this cosmetic, which really we're not going to inspect during the inspection, but I may put something, a stain or a bump in the door, a uh, scratch in the door, uh, 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 maybe uh, let's say a stain in the carpeting. That's That was always something. That's a cosmetic defect. If my client wanted me to put it in a report, yep, it's going to be in the report. But I normally don't put cosmetic defects in any inspection report. That's not the purpose of the home inspection. What about code violations? Well, you're not a code inspector either. Code book is this thick. The International Residential Code Book is huge. You're not a code inspector. You have a standards of practice, and that requires you to inspect certain things and a lot of the things that you're not required to inspect. So you're not performing a code inspection. You may find a defect though, that's kind of related to code. I would say if, um, if there's a space between the railing, guardrail, balusters, the spindles, if it's large enough for a four inch sphere to pass through it, if it's, let's say it's six inches apart, that's a defect. It's kind of based on code. It's also based upon when the house was built. But I inspect a house without any regard to when the house was built. So back then that six inch space was safe and then children kept falling through and getting hurt, some fatally. So they squeeze that to four inches and that seems to be working now in the code. And so when I inspect a home that was built 20, 30 years ago and I see spindles spaced too far apart, I don't say that I'm a code inspector and this is a code violation. I'll just say it's no longer safe. This is a safety hazard for small children that can fall through and that should be fixed. Maybe it won't be because it was built to code back then. A lot of real estate agents will tell you, well, that was built a code back then. Correct. Right. But we inspect existing homes mostly. And homes built to code way back then are now like not safe or not energy efficient. For example, a, a home built 30 years ago has very low insulation in the attic. But the standard now is hmm, a lot more insulation, maybe some air sealing. So it's not a code violation, but it could help my client understand what's going on in their home. What about manufacturer insulation recommendations? I don't mess around with those, although I may have it in my software, something to refer to, but I won't actually refer to it, or I'm not even responsible for how um, a heat pump uh, is installed according to manufacturer's insulation recommendations. That's not part of a home inspection. Okay. We're inspecting certain things in the standards of practice, according to the standards of practice, roof covering materials, they're in good shape, observed to be in good shape. I didn't, well, I found a hole in that little area there where the rake board is coming at an angle to the roof and that's um, opened up maybe to vermin. There's another one on the other side. And then there's a load bearing beam on this. This is part of the roof structure actually. So this is very serious and we need to get that fixed. That's a load bearing beam. That's the ridge beam load bearing. 
And that's a defect. That's a structural defect. And I would say that's a major problem because you need a contractor to fix that. You have to inspect the gutters. Well, they were dirty, need to be cleaned. That's pretty minor, dirty gutters. And then they were overflowing and I can see that they were overflowing here. Let's see if I can turn on, yep. And maybe created some water and then a crack there. And then downspouts, um, this California home had some downspouts and they were discharging right next to the foundation. Uh, the foundation here is a crawl space foundation. We'll see that later. I couldn't get into it, but this should be discharging away. It's discharging on a, on a surface, but it's really discharging right next to the corner of the foundation. You gotta inspect the vents and the flashing. There's soft vents and ridge vents. You have to inspect the flashing and the skylights and the chimney. We have a chimney here and other roof penetrations. There's a, the chimney there for the wood fireplace. Um, it used to be a, a, um, a in terracotta flue only, but then they um, put a, a stove insert and then the stainless steel connector pipe. I'm not required to inspect this, the interior flue liner. I'll inspect the exterior and the flashing, which has a problem here, as you can see, um, and some of the masonry is cracked off, but I'm not required to inspect what's inside the fireplace. There's another vent from the hot water source. Roof penetrations, stacks look good. Bent stacks from the sewer line look good. And then the general roof structure from accessible panels or doors or stairs. I couldn't see the, the roof structure actually in this home. And then I'm supposed to describe the type of roof covering materials, that's asphalt, and report as in need of correction any active roof leaks. What if I see um, watermarks, dry watermarks on the ceiling? Well, I'm going to put that in report as a correction recommended. Um, usually when a roof is fixed, they'll patch up everything that was damaged or cosmetically affected. So if the ceiling, you know, was leaking, you know, the roof was leaking above the ceiling and it caused water damage on the drywall, or the plaster, and they usually pat painted that up, and especially before a home inspection, they usually paint things up. But if it's still there, even if I probe it with my moisture meter, take a look at it with my infrared camera and it's dry, I'm gonna assume that the seller knows more than me about that. I'm gonna ask my client to ask the seller. I'm not gonna ask the seller. I'm gonna ask my client to ask the seller about that water leak. And we're just going to assume that it's dry, but it's an active water leak and it needs to be repaired or at least further evaluate or maybe explained away. So if I see a water mark on a ceiling, I'm gonna assume that it's an active leak. That's how I handle it. You don't. It says actively, active leak is like water dripping. So according to the standards of practice, you shall report as a need of correction, any observed indications of active roof leaks. And I think a dry watermark might be an, uh, an indication of an active roof leak. A real estate agent might wanna argue with you about, is it wet or dry? Um, all watermarks eventually dry out, right? Okay, yeah, should we get a hold of a mentor? Okay, good questions. Okay, remember, try to use Q&A, not chat. All right, at eight o'clock, I'm done with the roof. The roof inspection is about 15 minutes. I'm not out there for an hour. I'll take about 30, 40 pictures. Uh, we went over about a dozen of them, but I'm not up there for very long. I'm also done with writing the inspection report for that section. So before I stop and get to the next, system, um, I'm done because I'm writing my inspection report on my mobile device. And when I go to the next system, I'm done with that inspection of that system. The roof is right now at eight o'clock, the roof inspection is done. I've added my inspection pictures or video and um, I've written my comments. I've checked off the narratives and um, I'm on to my next system. And at around eight o'clock, I'm coming down from a ladder or I'm, I'm you know, putting away my drone and I'm meeting my client for the first time. And during the inspection process, I'm going to ask my client to follow me around if they'd like to, because I want to address all of their concerns and answer all of their questions. I don't want to do that at night. Right? I don't like to work at night. I like to get all of my work done during the day. 
So I want them to follow me. If they don't want to follow me, I scoot them inside, let them take measurements, um, think about painting and new carpeting and things like that and moving furniture in. And I tell them, I'm going to be on the outside for another 15 minutes. If I find anything, I'll, I'll grab you and show it to you. And then I'm going to go and do the other systems. And I'd like you to follow me around if you don't want to. And if I find something that we need to discuss, I'll make sure you see it and we'll put it in the report. If you find something that you want to report, I'll do that for you as well. And then at the end of the inspection, we'll do a little summary at the kitchen table. How's that sound? Boom. And I'm on to my exterior. And when I do an inspection, I do the same thing over and over again. I go counterclockwise around the house about twice, once or twice. Once, maybe a townhouse that's new, twice if it's an, a typical existing home, and if I can get around the entire home. If it's a townhouse, then it's like front and back twice. So I have an inspection process, and we talked about that process. And when you have an inspection process based upon a, the standards of practice as your foundation, then you are managing your time well. And remember that fraction, you want to make a lot of money divided by your time. And you want to expand that numerator by adding ancillary services and bundling them and dividing by time. And you want to compress the denominator. You want to compress your time. I'm not meaning that you should run through a house and blow off your inspection. I'm meaning being efficient. That means inspecting and writing the report at the same time and having an inspection process that is consistent for every home no matter what you're inspecting, how old it is, how big it is, if someone's with you or not, you're constantly doing the same. Every room is counterclockwise for me. Every system, I do the same way. So um, when you have a consistent process based upon a checklist, based upon the standards of practice, and you're doing that process over and over again, defects tend to jump out at you. So that is the, if you're trying to figure out how to find defects, you start with the standards of practice, figure out what you're required to inspect and not inspect, develop a checklist that's based upon an inspection process that works for you. And you do that consistently. And when you do that, defects tend to almost trip you. They jump out at you. It's very easy to find defects. If you're doing, so, if you're, if you're not following an inspection process, you can just imagine just going around and going from window to heating system, to roof, to structure, and you don't have any consistency, right? You don't get the full picture either. I have a complete picture of what the roof system is like. And now I'm going to tell the story of the exterior to myself in my report for my client. And to tell the story, you have to be consistently in the same pattern, right? So write your report as you inspect for various reasons, one being efficiency, and base your system of the exterior or the roof on the standards of practice and manage your time. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna inspect the exterior. It's about all it takes, you know? And it's what? My client shows up at eight o'clock, 8.15, I will have taken care of two systems and written the report. Oh, at the end of the inspection, I may provide the entire inspection report, likely, but for certain, I'll have a summary and I'll print out that summary for my real estate agent that I work with because they like to have like a little check mark thing to work on and negotiate on. They'll have that thing fixed. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to negotiate about that. We're going to get some money for that, and we're going to have that fixed. That's how I work with real estate agents. I know what they, I ask them, what do you need from my inspection? They want to print out of the summary immediately after the inspection. So that means I have to write the report while I'm inspecting. Learn how to inspect the exterior by going to natchit.org and type in exterior in the search field. Here's the standards of practice, all the things that you have to inspect. It looks overwhelming, but it's not really. Let's do it a little bit. Exterior wall covering materials. Well, on this home, I have stucco, I have cement, I have hard coat stucco. And it's called wall covering materials because that's what the International Residential Code calls it. There's a few ways to um, 
identify that there's about a dozen different types of stucco and eaves out there. And uh, one of them is to simply knock on it. Another one is tap. Another one is to push. Another one is to look at the flashing areas, the drainage um, planes. So I know I have a hard cut stucco on this house. And the trim is actually, you know, the things around the windows and doors, they're actually concrete as well. There's no, the details. This is not an eaves house. So I'm doing inspecting the eaves soffit and fascia. And there's the rake board and there's the, the beam again. And there's the soffit vent there. And there's the gutters and the, the fascia board. Uh, representative number of windows. I can't get around this area around here. So there's some dense vegetation, but I'm going to take a look at the representative number of windows. I have to inspect all of them, but I do have to inspect all of the doors. So there's the front door, there's the front exterior door. And I see I have indications of a crawl space for sure. These are vents and I can see there's a little mouse door there. This is the back door. I can see bird droppings or something going on there. And there's the door lock there. There's flashing and trim. I have to inspect adjacent walkways and driveways. Here's the driveway. There's my inspection vehicle. Uh, there's a crack in the concrete. Asphalt driveway, pretty good shape. There's a retaining wall around the pool, you know, for protection. The cracks in the concrete, I'm not really worried about them. Cracks in the asphalt, I'm not worried about them either. Stair steps, stoops, stairways and ramps. Got a couple steps there. These tiles, I know they're wet. I mean, they're slippery when they're wet. Um, I may comment about the, the cracked stone here and the mortar. I don't want, I like to take a look where two different materials touch or intersect. So like right here, I like to see what happens with the water. And if my client needs a railing here, well, we're gonna talk about that as well, even though I'm not a code inspector and it's not required by code. Code says four or more risers. But if my client needs a railing here, we'll, we'll just talk about it. And I won't put it in the report as, a, as a, a, a defect or anything like that, but I may put it in a report as a reminder that my client may need a handrail to get up there. Porches, patios, decks, balconies, carports, doing good there. Railings, guards, and handrails, not much going on there. Vegetation, surface drainage, retaining walls, and the grading of the property. So it's graded away pretty good on all sides. I like that sloped away, hard surfaces are sloped away, that concrete is sloped away and the driveway is sloped away as well. And the exterior, I know I have overhead cable and electric going over the driveway. I wanna make sure it's clear enough. There's some strange hoses coming from the, the pool pump. This is a discharge from the, and it goes into a gutter system, um, a downspout an underground drainage uh, pipe which I'm not required to inspect because we don't inspect underground drainage systems, but that's an odd thing to see. I'm gonna put it in a report and we've got some damage to the, to the eaves uh, trim at the retaining wall. And there's a the garage doors and the exterior, water faucets on the outside, I like to see them to be frost proof. They're kind of old. I'm not gonna turn them. This one's missing a handle really old hose pickets, hose bibs. There's the pool side of the house. I'm gonna tap on the bottom of the load bearing posts where they come in contact with the concrete sidewalk. I'm just looking for, well, there's hardly any wood trim, but I'm looking for wood in contact with the ground. There's a couple of damaged light fixtures, some debris some damage to the, the slate on the retaining wall around the, the pool. There's electronics that are very old, probably are not working well, um, a light sensor. I'm gonna put those in the report. I'm not, I don't even know, I don't even need to know what this does. Um, you can ask the seller. All of these receptacles need to be GFCI protected. They are not. There's a light switch there. There's a like a water feature that doesn't work anymore. It's kind of like a homemade one. Um, I couldn't get it on, to turn on. Um, 
and then there's a chip in the tile. These are kind of minor things I'm going around the exterior and noticing, but the tile, this patio looks fantastic. Can't have a, a, a screen around a dryer vent. Maybe it's a bathroom vent, but it's down low. Usually a bathroom fan is in the ceiling and goes through the attic or up through the soffit uh, or up through the roof. So I'm, I think this is a dryer. I'm not sure. Not sure why there isn't any lint. I just don't understand quite yet. That, so I'm looking at a component on the exterior that's connected to a system that I haven't gotten hold of yet. It's on the inside, the laundry. I consider the laundry area a system. And this is part of the component of it. You know, we're according to the standards of practice, we have to inspect the exhaust systems of the laundry. So um, can't have a screen, can't clog this up. So we'll see what's going on. And then the fences and other areas around the house, not required to inspect fences, but I'll take a look to see if there's anything major going on. And the exterior looks pretty good. So we're not code inspectors and home inspections are not code inspections, but everything home inspectors look at are related in some way to code or building standards or best practices or building science and safety features, especially. So no, knowing more about these topics will help a home inspector do a better inspection, I believe. Got a couple of good questions. Let's take them after the, the exterior system. So for me, this is kind of fun. This is the front door and there's a lot going on here. And as a home inspector, if you're new, maybe um, you'll just take a look and see if there's any major material defects here or something wrong that you notice. But for a certified master inspector, once you do a few hundred, a few thousand, you start to look at like, oh, like there's a few things here that are related to code that would make me a better inspector if I knew about them. Like how many steps, there are, there are two risers. There's one riser here and there's the entry. And how tall, is there a maximum or a minimum here? It's a maximum here can't go up very high on a step and there's a minimum tread. It can't have a short tread. Your foot will fall off, right? And these are safety features. So this looks good. This look, looks like good riser, look good riser. And the width, there's a certain width it has to be and you measure it not from here to here, but from the door that's open at 90 degrees to the jam and the path that leads to and from. Is there a, a step inside? Is there a landing on the outside? So these things are kind of fun. And the code is, you check for a landing at the front entry, egress door. So this is the front entry, egress door, and there's a landing here, right? It should have at least 36 inches in the direction of travel. So when you're running out the door because the house is on fire, you don't want to trip. You want just a clear path out. An exterior landing at the egress should not be more than seven and three quarter inches below the top of the threshold provided at the front door does not swing over. So the front door does not swing over the, the landing and there's seven and three quarters and seven and three quarters. That's great. The stair riser height should not, should not be more than seven and three quarter inches. So that feels good. You can measure it if you wanted to, but as a home inspector, you don't have to. So the top of the threshold to, to here and this nose to here, this is made out of concrete. The biggest riser height must not exceed the other one by three eighths of an inch and the tread depth should be at least 10 inches. And illustrations help. This is a illustration that I did and I put it on the internet gallery to help you understand how to measure the tread depth is from this nose to this area here. Not, not all the way back, but to the next nose. If you draw a line from the, the sequential nose, the next step nose down at a 90 degree angle. So this is the tread depth and this is the run and this is the rise. So all these things can help you when you're trying to explain what you're seeing here. And you've seemed to feel like there's maybe a difference in the step. Like when you go up steps, they're just uniform. And when one's off, you feel that, right? So that's one of the things you can notice about steps. And to explain to your client what may be happening, you may not want to refer to code, but you may want to know what the terms are, the terminology, like what is a tread and a riser and the tread depth. There's also slope, right? So this thing here should be sloped, right? It should be sloped away. We call it a wash. Everything should, be, our hard surfaces, especially right here, even the step should be sloped away 
And this should be sloped away too. This is a slope here and a slope here. And I bet this gets slippery when it gets wet. Not sure about that. And a handrail must be provided on at least one side of the flight of steps where there's four or more risers. But again, what if my client is 80 years old and she needs assistance getting up? I've inspected for those clients before, and this would be very difficult for some of my clients. So I take that into consideration. Remember, I'm not a code inspector. As a home inspector, it's so much fun because I'm not required to find all the defects, remember? And I'm not a code inspector. I inspect homes without any regard to the, it could be a brand new home or a hundred year old home. And I can talk about my client's needs. My client may need a handrail, even though there are two risers and not really pay attention to code, but I'm a better inspector if I do know what the standards are. So it's so much fun. You can go deep into this. Like if you're a certified master inspector, you realize there's no end to learning. You're always learning. Always be learning. And one of the fun things is for home inspectors, some home inspectors like me, is the International Residential Code. And if you go to this one, the section around handrails, R311, that talks about handrails. And codes are now online. The International Code Council, fantastic organization, they put all of their codes online for public access for free. That's really great of them. And here's chapter three. You can scroll down to the handrail. Well, you could do it. I won't do it now. Okay. And there's about guards and the four inch. Remember the four inch sphere, like homes built to code back then are now dangerous now. But if you can put a four inch sphere in a guardrail. And what does that actually look like? Well, Internet's gallery has a ton of illustrations to help you explain what defect you have found in a home. And so this is a really nice illustration. And I would put these illustrations in your inspection report to help you explain. A picture's worth a thousand words, so is an illustration. And Internetchi is an education provider um, approved by ICC, the International Code Council. And so Internetchi's curriculum is actually based upon code. So when you're taking Internetchi's courses provided by the only home inspector college in America, internetchi.edu, the curriculum is actually updated whenever the code is updated. So and let's see, for example, there used to be a maximum of 25 feet for a dryer exhaust. Now it's 35. And then there's some deductions and exceptions to that rule. So Internet's curriculum is updated. It's reviewed every year and updated so that you understand. That's why you should always be learning, taking CE courses if you're a home inspector. And if you wanna learn more about being an inspector and inspecting homes according to a code, a standard, we have a property maintenance and housing code inspector course. You can become a code inspector. You can become ICC certified. I took this um, course. I wrote the course. I took the course and I became ICC certified. I took the ICC exam and I'm a code inspector. So you can do that as well. You take Internet's course in order to pass the ICC exam to be a code inspector. And the course, uh, the course is free. It's called the Property and Maintenance Housing Code Inspector course. It's about 8.15. I'm done with the exterior. I have maybe walked around with my client. I have taken pictures and videos of the exterior and I've put them in the report and now I'm ready to go to the next type of system. And that for me is, the next one for me is the basement foundation, the structure and crawl space. And this house has a crawl space. And I do that because that's in the standards of practice at natchee.org slash SOP. And according to the standards, I have to inspect the foundation, basement, crawl space and structural components. I also have to describe the type of foundation and location of the access to the underfloor space. And if I wanted to read about structural issues and how to inspect the structure of a home, there's a textbook. We have text, we have over a dozen textbooks at the Internet College. And you go to this textbook there, or you go to any natchi.org page and you can type in, let's say you're weak in concrete. There's a little search field there, and you type in concrete. 
And you, there's the history of concrete. You can learn about reinforced concrete. You can concrete admixtures, visual inspection of concrete. We have an article about that. And there's, what is that? Oh, what is that? Oh, what is that? Well, shrinkage cracks, hairline cracks. So you can learn about structural inspections. And we also have a structural issues for inspectors course. So if you're weak in anything, don't, don't be afraid about that. That's easy. You just invest a little bit of time and learn about, well, how to inspect a crawl space, right? And InterNACHI e has those training materials for you. So according to the standards of practice, the home inspector shall report as a need of correction, any indications of wood in contact with or near soil, okay? Observe active, uh, observed indications of active water penetration for sure. Remember those downspouts? I don't like those downspouts. Observed indication is a possible foundation movement, like cracks in the drywall or out of square uh, doors. Any observed cutting, notching, or boring of framing members that may present a structural or safety concern. So I can't get into the crawl space. There's no access to it. And the cellar is unavailable. And this house is actually, um, uh, it's, not occupied currently. So there's no one to talk to and no one knows how to get in. So this is an inspection restriction. The problem is, oh, I, I see a notch. There's, a, there's some kind of cut in a joist right here. But all of this, I can see this is flexible ductwork and some of it is hanging and crimped and torn and deteriorated and the insulation is falling apart and it's laying on the ground. The floor was insulated in the past and now it isn't. And if I wanted to talk about the board hole or the notching in the floor joist, um, there's an illustration that can help me explain that to my clients, but there's a lack of insulation where it should be. And the crawl space is ventilated and we handle ventilated crawl spaces now differently. The floor is um, not covered. So there's a vapor barrier uh, missing. And so these are the pictures that I have and it's, it's not good. I can't get in. So I'm going to disclaim this system, but there are a few things from this vantage point that I can talk about. I can talk about the attic being ventilated and in, you can improve that condition. And there's an article about how to inspect and correct a vented crawl space. There's insulation problems. There's ductwork problems. And there's a, a vapor barrier on the, on the floor. And um, there's probably a few other things. So I'm gonna recommend further evaluation. Now, in relation to crawl spaces, you go to our article library and type in crawl space. And there's an article about how to inspect and correct a vented crawl space. Ideally, the building science is moving in this direction. If you have a vented crawl space, what you wanna think about is, you can recommend this to your client. You don't have to, but it's something if you learn about, you can recommend and have a discussion about it. It's better to seal up the vents and treat this short basement, this crawl space, like a short basement, right? So seal up the vents, and this is one way to correct a vented crawl space. We're no longer venting crawl spaces. The building science is moving away from venting crawl spaces, having open ventilated crawl spaces and sealing them up and considering that crawl space just like a short basement that's insulated, dry, no exposed dirt and no open vents. You control the environment if you like with maybe some air exchanges or not. Maybe the floor above is insulated and sealed. So that's where the building science is going. And you may be interested in reading this article. It's in our library about water penetration, water movement, vapor movement, and what a ventilated crawl space does to an entire house. Um, it's not all that great. So in California, there's a lot of crawl spaces and they're ventilated often. Next thing I inspect is the heating system. I have to inspect it using normal operating controls. And there's an inspection checklist for many things, like there's a gas furnace inspection checklist that's available um, on InterNACHI's website at that URL. 
and I can incorporate that checklist into my software. According to the standards of practice, I have to describe the thermostat, the location, the energy source, and the heating method. Well, I, I can find the thermostats, and there's two of them, and they're Nest, they're high-tech, really nice, efficient thermostats. The energy source is natural gas, and the heating method is um, forced air, because I see duct work. I have to report as a need of correction any heating system that didn't operate. That's obvious. Or if I couldn't reach it, if it was inaccessible, that's obvious. And there's two heating systems and these are packaged systems all in one. There's a heating and a cooling system. And this is the, um, this is the ductwork connection to the, to the house, right? So I'm taking a look at the, System on the outside, this is relatively new. The other one is a little bit older. It's on a base. Not sealed very well, but that's okay. I always take a picture of the manufacturing label. That's the exhaust. There's gas coming in, shut off valve, drip leg, electric disconnect for the unit. More labels. There's the exhaust old uh, disconnect, that's fine. And I turn the system on using normal operating controls, heating and cooling. Let's see how the, the system works. And this is the main return of the air from the house. And it's um, not done well, right? There's that's the air filter is improperly sized. It's very dirty and clogged and it's not properly sized there. And there's two pieces of plastic, essentially plastic filter. They need to be replaced. The second heating system, heating and cooling system is there. It's an older unit. I turn it on using normal operating controls. It's a package system on the outside. There's a gas shutoff valve. There's actually two. I don't know why, but there are two and electric disconnect. And again, this is where all of the air from the house, the house was split in two, two systems and all the air went into two registers, air return registers, big ones in the hallway, and then got conditioned and then blown through um, ductwork into the crawl space, insulated uh, ductwork in the crawl space and came out through the floor registers. And the cooling is the same. Inspect the cooling system, same systems, identify the thermostat, cooling method, anything that didn't operate or was inaccessible has to be in the report as in need of correction. Plumbing. Let's let's take a look at some questions. Shall we do some questions? Um, uh, radon, common test. I never heard about it until home inspection training. Is it legal to offer a second business that can offer up estimates to fix it? Um, uh, I can set. Why don't you email me, Ben at internet.org. Uh, what you don't want to do is um, uh, be in conflict. Have a have a potential code uh, violation of uh, your code of ethics, which protects you from um, having these apparent conflicts of interest. Um, what the 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 code of ethics is very clear. I think it's clause eleven that you're not required that you're not permitted as a home inspector to fix things that you find wrong during an inspection. However, um, a home inspection doesn't cover everything, right? So. It's possible to operate a company that does services that are not really covered by the home inspection. Um, but what you want to do um, is continue to um, have a clear distinction between the problems that you find and report and tell people to fix and the corrections. You don't want to really don't want to do don't want to have anything to do with fixing the problems that you identify in the inspection. Um, that is an apparent conflict of interest. Even if it actually isn't, you don't want to appear to have that conflict of interest. But um, I can hook you up with the attorney uh, of InterNACHI to help you with that, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, why counterclockwise? I don't know. Um, I just started that way. I go counterclockwise. It doesn't matter. It could be up, down, left, right. Like, um, how do you inspect a, a door? An exterior door. You're required to inspect all exterior doors. I go top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. 
I look at the top right, top left. This is a window too. Every window I do this, top right, top left. I mean, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Like that, left to right, left to right. And those corners tell me a lot. The flashing, the header, the framing, is it out? Maybe a lintel, if it's a steel lintel holding up brick or something. And then down here, I, I travel down the jams and the sides and I look at the tread and I look at any maybe trim and contact with something and is it rotten? And I look at the, the tread and the, the flashing and then the door frame itself. And then I close it and make sure it's square. And, or if it's a window, making sure things are square and looking for any kind of wood rot or damage or something like that. But it's always the same. Top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. It's an inspection process. And when I do that, that's how I find defects. Because I'm con consistent with my inspection process and defects get in my way. Sometimes they literally trip you. That's why we talked about steps for a while. Because steps you know, can trip people and then it's a safety hazard, right? You should see the code book on just stairways. It's huge because so many people have hurt themselves on stairs. That's what code essentially is. Code changes when people get hurt, like firefighters, right? There's a huge book about fire protection and safety features, like egress, right? And rescue openings, emergency rescue and egress for a basement bedroom. Okay. Um, I know that internationally has some great checks. Check Are they based upon the standards of practice? Yes, we have a, a checklist. We have a page of inspection checklist. You can email me and I can send you that. Um, like to discuss mentoring and CEA, fantastic. Uh, what does ICC code cert in your business? How do, you, how do you use the ICC residential code cert in your business? I don't. If I was a home inspector, um, my business partner was a, a code inspector. Um, we do not mention that certification while performing inspections or promoting your home inspection business. If you do, um, somebody could argue in front of the judge that they assumed that you would be inspecting code because you were promoting on your website that you're ICC code certified. So just careful with that. Um, do you charge a fee if the client requests that you come back and inspect an area that was inaccessible, such as crawl space? No. I mean, if they pay me full price and a system is inaccessible, um, that's a business strategy decision that you have to make. Um, it happens with radon as well. I mean, you learn that when you do radon and you can't place a radon test or um, you come back and all the windows of the home are open, you know, you have to redo something. Or if you're inspecting and the, the house roof is covered with snow or it's raining and you can't get up on the roof, um, things like that, that get in your way. So you have to make, can, do you have uh, um, an inspector um, who can go out and do those follow-ups. Um, sometimes things are repaired and they want you to come back to make sure it was repaired correctly. Um, do you charge for those things or not? Those are all really good, difficult business decisions that you have to make. Um, we usually try not to charge for those re-inspections. Okay. Good. Good questions. Let's go to plumbing. It looks overwhelming, but it isn't. And when you're using a, a mobile device with a checklist, man, you look really smart. I look really smart. Like I don't miss, I don't miss a thing. Like I'm, I know exactly what I'm doing. And it's literally because I'm just carrying the checklist, my inspection process with me. I mean, it reduces the amount of mistakes that I make. I'll still make mistakes for sure. But having the system checklist in front of me, with me, guiding me along, makes me look really smart keeps me efficient, remember time management, and it helps reduce errors. Uh, I have to inspect the main water shutoff and the, the fuel shutoff, and that's all in the crawl space there. Uh, water heating equipment, that was uh, restricted, um, but I got to, I got to it. Uh, water supply, including fixtures, flushing all the toilets by flushing all the sinks, for functional drainage, drainage waste and vent systems, sump pump accessible floats. I have to describe whether it's public or private. Here it's public. Location of the supply water fountain, that's in the, in the 
near the hot water tank, location of main fuel, that's also there, location of observed fuel storage systems, I don't have any capacity of the hot, hot water equipment. Report as in need of correction, any problems, like you turn on fixtures, two fixtures, two sink fixtures, or a sink in a tub, and you turn on the shower and nothing comes out, that's a deficiency. If the hot and cold fixtures are reversed, hot's always on the left. Active plumbing leaks, obviously, if you see a plumbing leak or indications of a plumbing leak, like dry water marks in the kitchen sink cabinet or something like that. Toilets that were damaged or didn't work. So bathroom, when I do the bathroom, you can group all the bathrooms together. You can stick the bathrooms under the plumbing section. I kind of like separate the bathrooms in a section of the report because I, I, that's my preference and I can do that. I can also don't include the kitchen in the interior section. I just include, I include uh, the kitchen as a separate part of my report. Laundry is the same thing. Laundry is a system. I consider it a system in my inspection process. So in the report, it's a separate system as well. This is the master bathroom. And most bathrooms are basically the same. You know, I, they're about five, 10 minutes at most. And it's hot and cold water at the sinks. I turn the sinks on. I turn the tub on, hot and cold water, turn the shower on, flush the toilet, see what happens, right? Wiggle the toilet with the side of my leg, flush it again, wipe my hands on the drainage pipes, wipe my hands on the valves underneath the sink, test the GFCI, turn the bathroom fan on. Is there a door? Is there a window? How are the services? So it's only a few minutes and I'm taking pictures. And after every bathroom, I'm done in my inspection report um, because I'm using a mobile device. So there's the bathroom here, master bathroom. Nice. Handle came off in my hand, so that's a, a problem. Good shower flow, good flow from the tub. There's no drainage stopper. It's just a rubber device there. You can see it there. It's no big deal. But this area here, I'm always looking at and it looks like we have some water. Um, it's not water damage, but I'm just looking to see if there's flow of water in this corner down here, if there's water marks or wood rod or something like that damage to the plaster wall. And there isn't, looks pretty good in the bathroom fan and skylight. Here's the half bath in the hallway, flush the toilet. Looks like they had some kind of repair with the water valve, looks good now. Maybe they just replaced the fixture um, because they're selling the home. And then there's the, you know, I put my hand underneath the, the P-trap and then underneath the valves. And if it comes out wet, then that's a, that's a water leak. Test the GFCIs using the test button or a GFCI tester and the, the bathroom is ventilated and the door, it looks pretty good. There's a second full bath. This is for the bedrooms. There's a toilet and the sink, run hot and cold water, test the GFCI. There's the shower, a pound on the shower walls and new tiles functional flow, the drain works, the handle is good. Just looking at the bottom corner, see if there's anything loose at the bottom of the shower and the fan there and the door works really well. There's the electrical. The electrical is, looks again, overwhelming, but you know, performing an inspection is fairly simple. It's fairly straightforward. What's really difficult is operating a successful home inspection business. So that's, that's why InterNACHI has a, a lot of, um, uh, resources and support for you as a business owner, because we want you to be successful. So we have a home inspection business course, for example, and it's free and online at InterNet G. So the electrical section of the home inspection standards of practice is pretty big. There's a service drop. What is a service drop? What is overhead service conductors? What's an attachment point? What's a drip loop? What is a conduit? Well, you have to say the right things, right? To be clear. You can't just say, well, this thing here with the wire uh, looks good. There's terminology that electricians use and contractors use, terminology related to the electrical service components. And that's available in our How to Perform Residential Electrical Inspections course. So if you go there, we have a picture of like this service entrance cable connection and the sheathing there and the service point, and there's arrows. What do the arrow, what are these arrow, red arrows pointing to? What are the orange ones pointing to? What are the white ones pointing to? 
What's the blue one pointing to? And what is a service drop? Well, here's a service drop. You know, we identified the service drop is the overhead service conductors located between the utility, electric supply system, and the service point. What's the service point? Well, the service point is the point of connection between the facilities of the service utility and the wiring of the house. And it goes, well, what's the overhead? Well, overhead service, and what is the cable assembly? And it just goes on and on and on about what things are. What's the service mast? What's the lateral? What's the electric meter, right? And what is grounding and bonding? This is all in the electrical course. And it's free and online to internet members to get it just right. A lot of inspectors are weak in electrical. No problem. We have many courses, text course like this one or a video course. We have an advanced training video course about how to inspect the electrical system, like the electrical panel and things like that and get the terminology just right. So there's a service drop and there's a service drop, right? There's a telephone pole transformer and the line coming over right to the house. Overhead service conductors and attachment point, that's what that is. Service head gooseneck drip loops, that's what that is. Service mast and service conduit raceway, the electrical meter base, I have to inspect that. Service entrance conductors, oh, there's the electrical meter there. And it's a general electric panel where there's the disconnect, I bet, underneath there. Main service disconnect, there it is. There's the main service disconnect. And this must, must be clearly marked, and it is. Must be either inside or outside the house. This one's outside the house, like California homes are. And close to the service conductors, and it is where they enter the house. This disconnect can't be in a bathroom, and it can't be more than six breakers. Um, no more than six breakers can be used to disconnect the service conductors. So there's a main service conductor. There's electrical meter, disconnect. There it is, disconnect. And a general electric there. Not sure what these things are. I don't know what that discharge to. Never figured that out. I don't know what that pipe is, gas pipe. And looks like this is grounded on a pipe there. And that's what that is. I don't know what that is. I don't have to know. I can just disclaim it and go, you better, this looks like pool stuff, right? For the pool. Panel boards over protection devices, circuit breakers and fuses. There's the panel board on the outside of the house under the meter, common in California. No, this has been ripped off. I don't know what's going on there. That's missing. There's the main disconnect. There's a lot of rust and corrosion and the wrong type of screw. I'm not gonna to touch this. Sometimes I take the dead front cover off. That's exceeding the standards of practice. It's dangerous to do so. Um, not really because of arcing, but you know, you don't wanna get zapped. You don't have to take the dead front cover off according to International Home Inspection Standards of Practice. So I didn't. It's rusty, which is commonly found when you have a panel outside like this one installed in this location on the outside of the house. It's not weather tight. I don't know what's inside. I also got some wasps, bees, building nests. The breakers themselves are loose. You can feel the breakers are loose here. Um, it's an old panel and it's not tight. You can see the dead front is a little bent, actually. It was bent, right? It was squished in there. And I'm not sure what these marks are all about. Rust, not sure. There's rust here, it's damaged dead front, openings between the breaker itself and the dead front cover, and it's not labeled very well at all, right? So you can see, I can't tell if there's an opacity problem or not. Um, looks like some breakers were replaced. Some should be tied together maybe. This is an old electric panel. There's the kitchen oven label. These are tied together. I'm not sure what reefer means, <laughs> refrigerator, I'm assuming, or you know, there's a marijuana growing in the house. I'm required to inspect the service grounding and bonding. So that is a weakness for many home inspectors, but that's okay. So I see this, and this is uh, a grounding to a pipe but it's been covered up so much. I can't tell exactly what, if this was installed properly, what kind of grounding wire or pipe that was, if it's 
it could be a, a wooden stick for all I know. It's been just covered up so much, right? Electrical bonding and grounding training for home inspectors is available in InterNACHI's free online how to perform residential electrical inspections course. And we go, we take it nice and slow. What is grounding? What is bonding? And how do, how do you inspect it? What should you be seeing, right? What is the grounding electrode conductor? What is that? And can you ground it to the water line only? Well, there was uh, right here, let's just read it. There are several methods of con connecting the grounding system to the ground with a driven rod being the most common in most areas. Most residential construction requires two separate grounding electrodes in any combination of the following, which could be six feet apart. So what I have is a water pipe. I don't see anything else. I can't confirm the bonding and I don't have anything else grounding. So I'm gonna put this in the report, right? Because I wanna I want to make sure that the system is properly grounded. Do I have any other electrical problems? I'm gonna group these problems together. I know I do. I don't have any AFCIs and I have a lack of GFCIs and I have a GFCI problem on the outside. So I have an, a need for an electrician anyways. So we're gonna pull this panel apart. I've got rust, I've got a bent dead front, I've got openings. Um, and now I have a concern about the grounding of the system. So I have, a, I have a way to get an electrician at the house if my client wants to. I'm gonna put it in the report as a recommendation. And I'm gonna tell my client, I recommend an electrician come before you move in. Now that they may not take that action. They may not do anything before they move in. They may wait, or they may have the seller fix stuff and they're gonna fix it as fast and as cheap as possible. So that's, that may not be the, the right decision. All those decisions I don't have to make. All I have to do is report upon the defects, the major defects that I see in the, in the, during the inspection and put it in the report, right? Uh, I have to test a representative number of switches and light fixtures and receptacles, including AFCI, where possible. So it's just a representative number. So I'm gonna test with my tester a representative number of wall receptacles, light fixtures. This one is missing a cover on the inside. A fans, I'm gonna turn the fans on. Sometimes they wobble out of control. But AFCIs are important, right? They're a safety feature. What if this house was built to code and AFCI didn't even exist, which is possible? Well, I'm gonna recommend it anyways, because AFCI is a feature. So uh, let's say I'm inspecting a house and it doesn't have GFCIs everywhere it's supposed to, right? Um, it doesn't have uh, GFCI. It doesn't have GFCIs on all kitchen counter recept on kitchen counter receptacles, you know, because the house was built 30 years ago, and back then it was only like six feet from the sink. Anything beyond six feet, you didn't have to have GFCI protection. Something like that. Old way of doing it. Well, I would inspect the kitchen and make that a defect because nowadays GFCIs need to be on just about everywhere in the kitchen, right? And in the bathroom as well and in the garage. And now GFCIs are in the laundry, right? AFCIs are everywhere as well. This house doesn't have any AFCIs. I'm going to inform my client the benefits of having AFCIs. And I'm gonna recommend that that electrician that we talked about earlier they bring in the recommendation for installing AFCIs where located. Where are they supposed to be installed? Well, we have um, inside the residential electrical inspections course, a section on AFCIs and GFCIs. If you want to know anything about AFCIs and GFCIs, it's right here. And here they are. Like it's basically uh, AFCI protection, uh, protection is recommended at 15 and 20 amp outlets on branch circuit for kitchens, family rooms, dining rooms, living rooms, parlors, libraries, and everywhere essentially. So that information is available to you. You put that information in your checklist and carry it with you so that when you're in that system, it will say if, if AFCI protection is normally installed in this area and it's missing, you can check it as a recommendation, but that's up to you. Let's see, where are we? Oh, and GFCIs. So I only have one GFCI here and that's for the bathroom, one. 
and I'm required to inspect for the presence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. I have a fireplace, so I want a smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. And smoke alarms must be powered by the building wiring and a battery backup. And they should be interconnected. So when one goes off, they all go off. And they should be in each bedroom, outside each sleeping area, and on each story, including the basement. We don't have a basement here. Now I'm supposed to ins uh, inspect and then describe and then report. So those three things. You're supposed to inspect a bunch of stuff, describe a, a few things, and report upon a few things and as a need of correction. I'm supposed to describe the main service disconnect, disconnects amperage rating, if labeled, it's not, and the type of wiring observed. I'm required to report as a need of correction the following defects and anything else that I feel like are defects. Deficiencies in the service entrance conductors insulation drip loop, clearances from grade, any unused circuit breaker panel opening that wasn't filled. We had two breakers that were removed, not sure why or just not used, and they were filled with those caps. The presence of solid um, conductor aluminum branch circuit wiring, if readily visible, any receptacles that had problems, and the absence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. And we actually had a missing smoke detector right there. Fireplace, we have a fireplace. There's a fireplace there with a stove insert. And remember, there's a chimney, masonry chimney used to be a solid wood burning fireplace chimney with a large flue. And now they have that insert there. Taking a look at anything around the fireplace that could essentially catch on fire because it's too close, could be cleaned. So I'll put that in the report. And the gasket, the rope is deteriorated around the door. I'll put that in a pretty minor. Attic insulation and ventilation, didn't have much to look at. Um, this roof slopes on uh, almost the entire house is uh, sloped and the interior ceiling is sloped as well. So there's no attic spaces, essentially. There's a couple above the um, bedrooms. I'm required to inspect the insulation of unfinished spaces, including attics and crawl spaces. Well, I was in restricted from the crawl space, ventilation of those spaces and mechanical, mechanical exhaust systems in the kitchen, bathrooms and laundry area. And I have to describe what type of insulation there was and the depth, and if there's any missing ventilation or insulation in those unfinished spaces. Next section for me is doors, windows and the interior. And about this time, I'm thinking of managing my time and it's about 10 or a little bit after that. So the interior, I'm gonna wrap up at about 10.30 and that's two and a half hours in. I started at eight, got there early, 7.45 did the roof, but eight o'clock was the scheduled appointment time. And about two and a half hours later, I'm basically going through the interior, heading toward the garage and the kitchen and I'm gonna wrap up. I'm looks like I'm feeling good. I'm gonna grab a 500 bucks at about 11 o'clock and I'm managing my time well and I'm finding problems for my clients and I'm telling the story of the house for my clients. I'm writing the inspection report as I go and I'm answering questions as I go as well. And I just have the interior here. So let's do the interior and let's continue. Representative number of doors and windows. I don't have to inspect all of the doors and windows. I have to inspect all of the exterior doors when I'm doing the exterior inspection, right? That's in the standards of practice, but the interior representative number of doors and windows by opening and closing them. Okay, there's a slider door. There's a pocket door and the, the fixture, the, the finger hold is missing, no big deal. And the rear slider to the pool. Floors, walls, ceilings. Yep, I'm taking a look at that. They look good. The interior looks really nice. No problems at all. Representative light fixtures. There's another ceiling fan and the doors and the slide and the floor looks pretty good. There's a little separation between the master bedroom flooring, which was replaced and the hallway flooring. No big deal, but I'll put that in a report for my client. No watermarks around the chimney. That's the chimney area there. Looks pretty good. I don't see any defects with the structure. Remember, we do have that one end of the ridge beam, the load-bearing ridge beam that needs to be um, attended to by a contractor. 
stairs, steps, landing, stairways, ramps, railings, guards, handrails, and the garage doors. And I have to describe the garage door as either manually operated or installed with a garage door opener. And it's an opener for both garage doors. This is one of them. And the concrete floor looks good. There's an inspection restriction in the garage. I can't see everything. I like taking pictures of inspection restrictions uh, so that I have them. I'll describe the inspection restrictions with text, but maybe I could use a picture like this um, if anything happens later on. This is one of the ways to test the photoelectric eyes. You wave something in front of them, see if they pop back. All garage receptacles should be GFCI protected. Um, I have to operate the garage door using normal operating controls. Um, the garage door opener shouldn't be on an extension cord. Extension cords are for temporary use only. How do I inspect a garage door opener? Well, there's a 10 step checklist for inspecting garage door openers in the attic, insulation, ventilation, and interior course. And here it is. And I did a little video about the 10 steps and the 10 steps are based upon a standard that's accepted. And you go through the 10, you put the 10 steps again in your checklist, make an inspection process out of it and you do it perfectly. And defects will just jump out at you and you reduce your um, errors, chance of making errors. Report as a need of correction. All these things, usually improper spacing between the spindles of a railing. Laundry, I handle laundry as a separate system. You may just want to tuck it into the interior section of your report, but here's the laundry, clothes washer and dryer, hot and cold water, discharge hose. It's a gas dryer, um, receptacles, and we need GFCI protection. There's the flexible conduit. There's the exhaust for the dryer. Remember on the outside? So that is the dryer. You can't have a screen on the outside, but it's disconnected from the back of the dryer. It goes outside there. This is the going outside part. And this is the dryer. It's supposed to be here, right there. It's supposed to be, this is supposed to be connected to that. So right now the dryer is exhausting in the back. And you can see all the lint in the dryer. I don't understand. So it was just a oversight, a mistake, something. And there's even lint building up on top of this. So we have to connect this to the back of the dryer. The laundry, <clears throat> the laundry has an exterior door. I can see the deadbolt like a half inch. I can stick my finger in between there. That may be a safety feature. May want to have a contractor fix that. The garage door, uh, the door at the laundry, the exterior door is steel. So it's not a square or anything or warping. Um, there's just a, some type of separation that I noticed. And it's also um, an energy efficiency problem as well. You can see daylight coming through. And there's a register there, all receptacles and laundry, GFCI protected. Um, this uh, shelf is falling apart. Um, the light, another light fixture uh, problem there, kitchen. When I'm at the kitchen, it's like 1030 and I'm feeling good. I'm managing my time well. At about 1045, I'm gonna wrap up the kitchen. It only takes me 15 minutes to do a kitchen inspection like this. And I turn everything on like hot and cold water, garbage disposal, uh, trash compactor, if I can figure that one out, I'll disclaim it if I can't, um, cause I don't test the pressure or anything like that. I'll turn on the dishwasher, short, short cycle, stove and oven, vent, windows, floor, ceiling, GFCI protection, and so on. Cabinets, they all look good. This kitchen's doing great. Oven, microwave, GFCI protection. There it is there hot and cold water at the sink, the sprayer works, the garbage disposer is not installed, but man, I think it was, or something's going on with this sink. Um, not sure why it is so greasy, but it had a problem and uh, I wanna make it into a, a plumbing problem that needs to be fixed because whenever you fix a pipe like this, um, the plumber usually wipes it down. So this has not been fixed and I'm not sure if this is an active leak. I tried to get it to leak. I couldn't get it to leak. It's kind of like, what do you call watermarks below an old roof? Well, an active leak or a concern or a defect, or maybe it's a request for your client to ask for more information. And that's my job. This is not normal. It's not wet. It's not dripping on the floor right now. I can't get it to leak. Wish I could get it to leak. In fact, that's my job. My, if I can get this to leak, if I can cause a leak, that'd be great. I'll put it in the report. 
right? But right now I'm just like guessing and I just don't have all day to figure this out. So it's gonna be in a report. Short cycle of the dishwasher, then a do a summary because I use software that allows me to produce a summary at the very end of the inspection immediately. And if I wanted to hold off on my entire report until I feel more comfortable with my photos or video or something like or the wording or something like that, I could do that. But my client and my real estate agent, their real estate agent wants a summary so that they can move on and get to their goal, which is different from mine. My goal is to tell the story of the home. Their goal is to get in the home. Agent, agent wants to sell the home, bring it to closing. Buyer has found their dream home and wants to know, is there anything major? And that's the summary. So I go over the summary report. I can go over the entire report if they want to. And then I take credit cards and I'm on to my next inspection. And this is a, a sample report. This isn't the report of this house. This is just a report that I wanted to show you. It looks like this. I do a lot of pictures. I take pictures of everything that's good as, and if there's a problem, I'll take a picture of that and that'll be in the report as well. So if it's a house without any problems, that's actually very valuable information for my client. I'll have a ton of pictures in the report, but if there are problems like this one is missing um, a fixture uh, at the top of this light fixture, there's a cap missing. I'll put that in the report and the correction and further evaluation title is in red, um, bolded, italicized. Everything else is blue or black, but red means bad. And red is a, a correction that's recommended. So you'll see I have uh, maybe a, a few dozen pictures in the report. Typical report is about 30 or 40 pages long. And this is the basement for the, this house inspection report. So I'll, I'll put pictures in there of the basement restrictions and the attic and type of insulation. Not every photo is in the report. And this is a PDF. So if you wanted to do, your client can have a PDF if they wanna download it and hold it in their hand or read it like this, but it's usually a link and it's cloud-based. And I love software that allows me to embed videos you can't have a video in a PDF, but if it's in the cloud, your report is in the cloud and you're providing access um, to the report to your clients, they can watch videos as well. This is really good for absentee um, clients. I love doing a summary video of the defects of a house for clients who didn't show up at the inspection. And that's it. Um, those are the three things I wanna finish with you. That's the InterNACHI logo, the school logo, and the certified professional logo. If you are a certified professional inspector through InterNACHI, use this logo on all of your marketing and uh, business cards and uh, websites. Um, and uh, speaking of websites, I helped this company develop and they build custom websites for InterNACHI home inspectors. They only serve InterNACHI certified inspectors. So if you're a CPI or you're thinking about becoming a home inspector and getting certified, you're going to need a website. And this is uh, a great company. Um, they're fast and affordable. And if you um, want to contact them, it's fast site for you, F A S T S I T E, the number four, the letter U, fast site for you.com. And uh, contact them and get your website built. What are the questions that we have? Any more questions? Thank you. So panel disconnect, suppose verify can AFCIs. Yes, um, I hate testing AFCIs. I try not to test them actually. I just look for their presence and that's okay. Um, you can test them, um, but um, I don't wanna turn things off. Like computers uh, where you don't have work saved, that's always a, a pain in the butt. Um, cable, sometimes, you know, the, the Wi-Fi. And uh, all that uh, AFCI testing, I'm very hesitant on. But GFCIs, I test anything with GFCIs and make sure you reset them. Um, when did you first, when, when, when you first started, did your inspections take longer? Yes, um, about four hours. We only did one a day because you can only fit. Um, nobody wants to do 
more than four hour inspection. Nobody wants to do an eight hour inspection. So you have to manage your time. And it's expected that a home inspection takes about two to three hours. Um, three hours, people start to get a little tired and a little antsy. They're wondering when you're gonna wrap this thing up. Um, so uh, when, it, when the home gets big, like 5,000 square feet, hopefully you bring somebody to help you um, or you set the expectation, tell them that you are going to take all day because uh, 5,000 square feet or bigger is an all day affair for one person, um, in my opinion. And um, older homes take longer. And um, so we, we charge more for older homes because um, we're trying to get that billable hour to be about $100 an hour, right? So we charge for older homes, which take longer. And we charge for larger homes, which take longer. And we charge for homes that are far away, which take longer to get to. That's more driving time. And you should be paid for driving. So if I'm going to make um, $500 at my inspection, I'm including the driving time. I'm including, my, including all of my time as a home inspector, which is driving to and driving back. So if it takes me an hour to drive to uh, an inspection and three hours to inspect it and a, an hour to drive back, that's five hours. I want to make $100 an hour. I need to make $500 at the inspection. That's one general rule of thumb method of trying to figure out, a calcula uh, try to calculate a profitable inspection fee. In the home inspection business course, chapter 11, we do an example with inspector John who's trying to figure out how to calculate a profitable home inspection fee. And we go through the simple math because to calculate a profitable home inspection fee depends upon math, basic math, adding, subtracting, dividing, multiplying. It's not based upon feeling. It's not based upon necessarily primarily what your competitors are charging because um, Inspector Mary may be charging way too much or Inspector Joe, he could be charging way too little, right? And you don't want to be charging. Um, you don't want to be in the business and distinguishing yourself with others based upon price. You don't want clients to be price shopping. You want to be um, competing on value. You want to be um, building your brand that distinguishes you from all the rest based upon value, not on price. Because if everything is the same and the only distinguishing characteristic between you and all of your competitors is price, then the lowest price wins. And that's no good for anybody. People just call up and ask for, what is your price? What you wanna do is compete on value. You wanna bring incredible, overwhelming value to your clients so that you can charge more. So what I recommend is adding value. And one of the things you can do to add value is get certified in ancillary services. So if you go to natchi.org page, whoop, that's fast site for you there. If you go to natchi.org page, natchi.org slash certification, and you get an ancillary services, um, you get trained and certified in additional types of inspections like being infrared certified. I highly recommend getting an infrared camera like um, the Perfect Prime camera or a FLIR camera. FLIR is fantastic. And we have a, a FLIR C2. I don't think they make them anymore. Maybe they're not C3s or C5s. Become infrared certified. And that allows you to use infrared, which makes you a better home inspector, but it also adds value. You always wanna be building your business and building value, solving your clients' problems, giving them what they need, trying to serve them, serve their needs, serve them, answer their questions, fulfill whatever is lacking in their lives, right? So overwhelm, try to overwhelm your clients so that you can drive up demand and, and charge more and make more money so that your business fraction, your numerator, the top part of the fraction is very large. Your gross revenue is very big divided by your time. And I think we talked about those things. Overwhelming value, 
managing your time, knowing how to perform an inspection. Um, the standards of practice is the foundation of your inspection process and your checklist. That's how you find defects. And if you are weak in any subject, you go to InterNACHI's online curriculum and you find those training courses that you need in order to develop as a, a fully competent and experienced home inspector. And InterNACHI has that. We have an online tuition-free college, internachi.edu. And this, I think, is it. This was an InterNACHI webinar. I thank you so much for attending the webinar. And if you need us, we're on our contact page. My email is right there, ben at internachi.org. And we're all on the contact page at natchiorg slash contact. Feel free to reach out to me for anything that you need in your home inspection business. And um, I'll see you on the next webinar. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Bye.